Hey, everybody. We get here, uh, started here in a moment. I think everybody's starting to uh, pile in. All right. And um, I'll go ahead, since it is uh, a little bit afternoon, I'll go ahead and get started uh, and jump right into it. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Right. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So today is going to be a continuation of our SBTC education series. So the last uh, couple of weeks, we've gone into an SBTC overview. Um, a little bit more of a technical deep dive. And then today we're going to talk about Stacker DB and then also just have a broader conversation about SBTC um, and the ecosystem around it. Um, so as always, this is meant to be, um, you know, kind of a, a lively active session. So if you do have any questions or comments as we go through the material, um, please feel free to uh, either unmute yourself, ask the question, or you can uh, pop a question into the chat um, whenever you uh, whenever you have something come up. So um, the agenda for today is to first start off by just reviewing last time some of the information that we covered really quickly, um, and then jumping into Stacker DB, what it is, uh, why it's relevant to SBTC, um, how threshold signatures work with SBTC. Um, and then the, with that, Frost in the DKG system, which we've talked about a bit in the past. Um, and then after we go through that material, we'll be having more of a broad SBTC ecosystem chat. Um, it, it, Andre was, uh, was uh, friendly enough to be able to join today to be able to kind of have uh, partake in that conversation about some of the things going on in the SBTC ecosystem. So very much looking forward to that. Um, and then also uh, hope that everybody here uh, can also chime in with their thoughts about SBTC as we wrap up this portion of the educational series. And then afterwards, we'll be continuing with the Nakamoto education uh, starting next week. So um, here are some helpful links. And before I actually jump into it, I'm going to go ahead and paste these again into the uh, chat for everybody. All right. And then we'll go ahead and get started. These are just general resources that might be relevant for those that are still learning about SBTC. Um, the first link there is uh, around our developer release. It's been going on and is live now. Um, a lot of the developers and end users um, have access to the tools to be able to begin testing and completing tasks. Um, so definitely, if you do have uh, any feedback on that process, definitely let us know as well. Um, really excited to see the progress that's going on there. So beginning with the review and as just a general overview, SBTC, as we've been talking about the last few weeks, um, provides a decentralized, permissionless, and trustless version of Bitcoin to exist on the Stacks blockchain that does not rely on centralized custodians to be able to maintain uh, custody of the Bitcoin asset, but instead uh, that ownership of our custody of that um, Bitcoin is maintained by signers, in this case, the stackers, who will collectively be able to manage and control the peg in and peg out operations uh, for Bitcoin onto stacks as SBTC and subsequently back to the L1 uh, as standard Bitcoin. Um, this is very important to the overall evolution of the Stacks ecosystem, as this brings a new option with a new set of trade-offs uh, for Bitcoin on the Stacks blockchain, but it allows it to be more flexibly used within smart contracts, um, with all of the DeFi applications uh, for trade, buying NFTs, and things like that on Stacks uh, that are not present on the Bitcoin L1. So really kind of bringing a lot of those characteristics uh, to the Stacks ecosystem without having to just rely on a uh, centralized custodian that's maintaining that peg for us that we have to trust. So as you can see, there's a couple of core pillars that are really defining how it was designed with that open membership, economic efficiency, Bitcoin finality, 
Um, and when combined with some of the improvements that are coming in the roadmap with Nakamoto, we will also be seeing that increased transaction times as well, or that increased transaction speed as well. Um, so as a general overview, the process for users and those that have been participating in the testnet have probably gotten a little bit familiar with this process. It's going to be a user sends in some Bitcoin. Um, they are going to be de uh, uh, delineating that that Bitcoin should be pegged in and have uh, SBTC produced and minted by the protocol and returned to a particular stacks address. That's all going to be part of that initial transaction, that information. Once that transaction is confirmed on the L1 blockchain, um, the SBTC protocol can essentially kick off where those signers can validate that that transaction on L1 has been received. Um, they can coordinate um, using Stacker DB, which we'll be talking about today, um, to be able to essentially come to, come to a consensus about um, whether or not that particular transaction is valid and has met the rules of what SBTC has been defined as and can mint that SBTC and send it to an end user for use uh, as a standard SIP10 token within the Stacks ecosystem. It being a SIP10 token is an important part of this because it does give us the ability to use all of the infrastructure that's been around in the Stacks ecosystem for fungible tokens uh, can be easily extended to SBTC here so that developers that have already built DeFi applications, wallet integrations, et cetera, uh, should have a really easy uplift for being able to um, provide SBTC access to their end users. So again, one of the things that we went through last time was kind of going through a little bit of a feature comparison of the various forms of Bitcoin, um, whether that's on-chain Bitcoin, where you're going to really have all of those benefits that we know and love about Bitcoin, trustless, permissionless, um, using that proof of work consensus, um, how it doesn't necessarily have a lot of that flexibility or programmability, even though that is changing with some of the new innovations that are happening around Bitcoin but it's always going to be more limited than a full smart contract platform with global state like we have with Stacks. Um, to date, it's always been wrapped versions of Bitcoin that have existed on the Stacks ecosystem where um, users would be able to deposit their Bitcoin with a centralized custodian, and then they would get a tokenized representation of that Bitcoin that they can use um, like any other SIP10 token within DeFi applications. But that does come with the downside of having that permissioned system where if there's something that's deemed inappropriate by a particular that centralized entity or, um, you know, they have some kind of um, lo loss of funds or something like that with the L1 Bitcoin, it's all up to uh, that centralized custodian to maintain that peg and maintain trust in the system. Um, but you do get the programmability. SBTC is looking to close that gap where you're still getting a lot of those benefits that we see with L1 Bitcoin in terms of having that trustless design, it being permissionless, and it being a decentralized set of signers that are going to be essentially uh, custodians of that L1 Bitcoin, uh, where you don't have to put your trust in any one single entity, and you can trust that the economic incentives of the SBTC ecosystem will ensure that they behave in an honest manner, removing that trust element uh, that we have with the custodial options. And for this reasons, we think that a lot of people when looking at the trade-offs between uh, the various ways to interact with Bitcoin, we'll see SBTC as a great fit uh, for having those benefits of programmability, but also uh, kind of the ethos of L1 Bitcoin that we all know and love. Um, we also last time talked about the SBT signer and the role that they play. Um, so essentially, these signers will be the stackers that are participating in the stacking, the proof of transfer uh, stacking process to earn Bitcoin. That Bitcoin that they're earning is essentially what economically incentivizes them to behave honestly and uh, properly process the peg-ins and peg-outs. Um, they will be tracking the particular UTXOs that should be actually sent back to users upon a peg-out request, and they'll be using StackerDB to coordinate, um, which is going to be the main topic for today. So um, jumping into StackerDB, um, specifically what this is going to be used for is storing the various cryptographic data um, that is produced and used by the signers to be able to produce their threshold signatures, to be able to reach that 70% consensus that's needed to be able to process pegouts, for example, 
Um, that coordination will be done through the stacker DB uh, instance that will be on the nodes that the uh, stackers are actually using when participating in the consensus. Um, so this is going to be enabling that threshold signature process as we, as we mentioned. And there's really two main components that come together to build up StackerDB. Uh, the first is going to be a smart contract portion, um, which is going to be essentially defining who's participating in the process. So who can write data to StackerDB, what data can be written, other particular parameters like that. And then uh, the second piece is going to be the overlay network of the nodes. Um, and this is going to be essentially them replicating that data across the entire set of nodes that are participating in this consensus um, to make sure that they all have an accurate picture of the current state of StackerDB. And you have that fault tolerance to make sure that if there's you know, one particular person acting out of sorts on the network or you know, modifying their node to behave in a particular unexpected way, um, it doesn't corrupt the entire system. Um, so the StackerDB becomes that uh, essentially distributed and decentralized uh, layer of truth that the stackers can use to coordinate their operations when processing these pegins and pegouts using these threshold signatures. Um, I will say, as we kind of go into some of these topics and we're diving into under the hood of how SBTC is functioning, uh, it is good to keep in mind for end users that maybe aren't as technically inclined if you're not a developer, um, that these implementation details are really how we provide those trust mechanics that we were talking about here. So, you know, for an end user that's just, you know, using, they want to use some smart contracts, they want to deposit some Bitcoin into a DeFi app, they may not necessarily understand how something like StackerDB relates back to that. Um, and at the end of the day, they don't really have to think about that when they're interacting with SBTC. Again, it's just a SIP10 token that they'll be using in whatever application they want. But StackerDB and that distributed uh, model of making sure all the nodes themselves are behaving in an honest way and the process that we use for threshold signatures and making sure that there's not one entity that can corrupt the system, it's all how we provide that trustless and permissionless feature set um, that moves us away from the custodians. So that's really kind of the reason why we're going through these details. Um, but you know, keep in mind, as an end user, you're not necessarily going to have to think about StackerDB very much. It's going to be more just knowing that this is what helps provide those guarantees that the system maintains its uh, honest structure, if you will. Um, so, and also with the data that's going to be generally stored, um, it's not going to be stored on chain. Um, obviously, there is that smart contract portion where they'll be kind of registering and making sure that uh, the smart contract will be dictating kind of how these slots are filled and who has access to write to um, these particular slots that make up StackerDB. It's um, the data itself um, that's provided is not something that needs to be stored on chain to increase the essentially the size of data that needs to be maintained by the Stacks blockchain itself. So where this becomes relevant in the process, we've walked through kind of the peg-ins and peg-outs in the past. Um, Can so I ask a quick question on the last slide? Yeah, yeah, sure. It seems like that's like a, a super vague and loaded data or bullet point. What kind of data is being stored off chain? Where is it being stored and who's in control of that data would be a question that immediately jumps into my mind. I can answer that. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So the data that's being stored, as far as the stacker DB concerns, it's just bytes. Um, the number of bytes you get is controlled by the smart contract. Like each slot can have a finite number of bytes available. The specific data in the application of signing SBTC transactions and signing blocks is this is um, commitments to polynomials that, when summed up, allow you to produce aggregate signatures and derive the aggregate public key across the stackers. Um, the data is stored in each Stacks node. The Stacks node itself maintains a separate database into which it stores copies of the StackerDB's chunks. Um, every, stack, every Stacks node that subscribes to a particular StackerDB replica um, will store the chunks for that database. But storing that data is a fully opt-in process unless you happen to be a stacker. However, I encourage people to run replicas of the StackerDB instance that will be specific to um, stackers signing because that would allow stackers a greater degree of resiliency when it comes to um, recovering from like a local stacker crash, for example. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah. The, the hearing that it's part of the node. That, that's what I was, was looking for. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. Yep, yep. And I think um, it's good to kind of point out to you, one of the things that I noted when reading kind of the material for Stacker DB is this is, you know, kind of designed with SBTC in mind, but it's also more flexible and kind of goes beyond just SBTC. Um, so there are going to be other scenarios where you'll see this, you know, just kind of coming up with the Nakamoto upgrade. And then also, I would imagine, and yeah, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, there could be potentially other areas where this could be utilized by, you know, other innovations that could come in the future. Uh, it seems like it would be useful in any scenario where you're using threshold signatures um, altogether. And there could be other things besides SBTC where that becomes relevant. Um, so, oh, it's you know, even more generic than that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, go yeah, for it. Yeah, you don't even need to store cryptographic signature data. Um, you could store NFT data, for example. Um, you can have a StackerDB instance that's bound to a particular smart contract, but that can be any smart contract. Um, I was just at uh, Bitcoin Unleashed uh, in London last week, I was talking with a person who actually just wanted to do just that. He wanted to set up an NFT marketplace, but have the NFTs stored in Stacks nodes that subscribed to his NFT contracts StackerDB instance. Um, SecretDB, I kind of think of it as kind of like the spiritual successor to the Gaia system, except, you know, this time it comes with the node, so there's no extra thing you have to go set up, and it's fully decentralized in that um, nodes simply uh, subscribe to replicas and host replica data on a node-by-node -node basis, as opposed to there being a single provider somewhere that has to go set it up and maintain it for everyone. That's really cool. I could see that being super powerful for something like DNS, right? You for know, sure. Having, having that DB right there. Yeah, I would, I would, I would maybe think about updating the bullet point there and mention that it's part of the node. This could trigger some decentralization. Like my first thought was, oh, it's a database sitting on AWS somewhere that somebody has full control over and can take down at any point, right? Yep. So, just maybe expand on that. Thanks. Yeah. No. No. Appreciate uh, appreciate the conversation there. That's a good clarification. Um, cool. And so. Um, Specifically when uh, kind of talking about like a peg out, for example, here, um, I just wanted to kind of point out where exactly um, this is going to be coming into play. So when, you know, the user submits the peg out request um, that the, the contract's essentially going to um, lock the user's SBTC within that contract. And then there's going to be that coordination that's going to be required to actually sign the Bitcoin transaction to send that Bitcoin back out to the user. And this is going to essentially be where, as Jude was describing, they're going to have to go through that process to coordinate to create that actual public-private key pair to do the signature to actually send that Bitcoin out. Um, and that's going to be where StackerDB is playing behind the scenes. Um, but to an end user, again, this is going to be transparent. They're not going to really know anything about that. Um, it's just going to be, you know, they. They're trusting that the network is operating and the stackers are honest and they will be just waiting for their transaction. And, um, but this is kind of how we vary. Um, and same uh, for, oh, I thought I had one for Pegin, but it's the same thing on the Pegin side. Um, very much the same process is going to be used uh, for generating even the public address that's used for the deposits. Um, now, every time that um, there is a new Bitcoin block, there is going to be a reevaluation essentially of the smart contract to make sure what permissions users have for, for Stack or DB, for those slots that we were talking about, for how you know, various users have areas where they could you know, be submitting their, uh, their signature data or their cryptographic data. Um, now, if a um, signer uh so like if a signer's a slot's data can be evicted if the signer changes and that is going to be something that's important especially when we start talking about the nakamoto upgrade or we're talking about uh, just generally when we end one particular stacking cycle and go to the next there might be a completely new set of signers that are you know exiting from being stackers and there might be new ones that are coming in to become stackers at that point and so there will be a rotation that's part of that process to make sure we're generating a new set of public addresses that are based upon the new set of stackers and um, kind of getting rid of the permissions that old stackers that are no longer participating had within the system. Uh, so because of this, when we do have those new uh, blocks come through, 
there's going to essentially be a reevaluation based on the smart contract that's dictating Stacker DB um, to kind of make sure that everything lines up appropriately. Um, uh, as as um, as Jude was mentioning earlier, the nodes are going to be maintaining kind of that data, and they will be maintaining replicas of all this data, so they all do communicate and um, with peers and pass this information that they have to all of their peers until they all reach essentially consensus of what the state of the DB should look like. Um, so that'll generate kind of an overall graph of the network so they know kind of what other Stacker DB instances are around and what they all look like. They should all essentially reflect the same information. Um, and there were a couple of situations too, um, and this is not necessarily going to be super instrumental for the SPTC sign of uh, StackerDB, but um, there are some special transactions that have to be included by miners, um, and the stackers actually have the ability to kind of force this, force the hands of the miners um, to be able to uh, authorize these transactions and include them in blocks. Um, because they can refuse to sign blocks if they're not included. Um, and these would be things like tenure changes. So again, this will be where we'll kind of jump into this with um, especially the Nakamoto upgrade. You know, think about this when um, we're changing between one particular um, person being authorized to kind of mine blocks to another particular miner being able to mine blocks. Those tenure changes will be something, um, transactions, special transactions, that cannot be refused. And in a similar thing, um, in scenarios where Bitcoin happens to fork, um, StackerDB will also have the ability to have some of those transactions that would need to be replayed. They can force those to be uh, included uh, within the blocks that new miners will be producing. So um, all of this as it relates back to SBTC, so that's kind of what StackerDB kind of is at a high level, how it functions. But essentially, at the end of the day, it's allowing them to store that cryptographic data that's allowing them to sign these transactions. And it allows or facilitates the usage of the signing protocol uh, like Frost. And so that is going to be essentially what's essential for producing those addresses, for processing transactions and creating them to be broadcasted out to the network and allows them to reach that 70% threshold where we have enough signatures or approvals or votes of a thumbs up, essentially, that this is a good transaction that's following the protocol rules and should be a peg in or peg out request that's processed accordingly. And that also gives us the ability to make sure that no single entity anywhere within this can unilaterally sign off or steal funds from the end users. Again, it would take massive coordination of all of these stackers and signers to be able to pull something like that off. So um, as we were talking about and before, and we're not gonna necessarily dwell on this, we'll probably move into kind of the discussion around the SBTC ecosystem here pretty soon. Um, but Frost is going to be that distributed signing protocol that receives those threshold signatures. We've talked about this in a couple of the previous sections. Um, but if you do have more curiosity around that, there is actually a great white paper that's produced specifically about the Frost protocol that would be useful um, if you really care about kind of like the cryptographic primitives that are used to be able to do this. And then there's the DKG process, which is the distributed key generation to create those uh, key shares that will be used by the individual nodes. Um, and you know, really the main thing that I wanna kind of point out here is that does provide that Byzantine fault tolerance system so that you do have some protection from particular individual nodes acting in a kind of a, a bad way, a nefarious way, not working at all if there's just a failure scenario with particular nodes. Uh, in all of these scenarios, the system is still able to move forward and recover from that. Um, so that's kind of the, the big thing here. So I want to pause and see, are there any questions in general about, you know, Stacker DB, kind of the process of producing these signatures to be able to reach that threshold and process those peg-ins and peg-outs? Um, if not, we'll go ahead and move on to kind of a discussion around the SBTC ecosystem. And let me quickly check to see if there's any questions in the chat here. Um, let's see. So it looks like this was already answered, but I'll read it out. Uh, so is it correct to assume the mint of SBTC will take at least as long as it takes to mine the current Bitcoin block? I'd expect it to mint from a transaction in the mem pool. And uh, the answer was that's correct. And it looks like that's all. 
Um, so right now, now I, I think it makes sense to go ahead and make a little bit of a migration into talking about just generally what SBTC is going to look like within the uh, Stacks ecosystem. Um, and uh, I definitely want to invite up um, uh, Andre, if he's uh, still with us here, to be able to kind of give his perspective as well on things that he's seen uh, with SBTC in terms of interest from some of the developers within the ecosystem. Um, you know, kind of what he foresees as uh, kind of where, uh, where SBTC is going to um, be thriving within Stacks. Um, yeah, just definitely, uh, definitely would love to, love to hear your opinion there, Andre. Yeah, sure. Um, everyone across wire, that, that was a really great sort of high level overview of everything happening on SBDC. So first off, wanted to uh, say just great job on uh, covering such a such technical topics at a really high level. Yeah, thank um, you. I think, I guess maybe it makes sense to start first with talking about parts of the ecosystem that are related to, um, I guess, most related to StackerDB and some of the changes that you're talking about. So the first thing that comes to mind to me is how that impacts the process of stacking itself. Um, there will be some uh, updates to uh, stacking given the new Nakamoto upgrade. Um, for, for the majority of users, it will be uh, fairly similar in terms of, um, you know, continuing to stack with a pool uh, like Krieger pool or Xverse or, or one of the other, these, other, these others. And we're, we're actually um, part of our ecosystem efforts is, um, you know, recruiting uh, more of these pools to, to come online after Nakamoto. Um, and the way that these pools operate is going to change, right? So as of right now, you really just have to interact um, with the proof of transfer for uh, consensus. And, and there, there isn't really any additional work that um, that sign that stackers have to do in order to be able to start receiving those rewards um, after the Nakamoto upgrade? So they play a critical role both in terms of um, validating new block production, so working with miners to actually validate those blocks, and signing uh, SBTC peg in and peg out transactions, and so. A lot of so a lot of our ecosystem efforts around this have been focused on working with these sorts of stacking pools to make sure that they are ready for this upgrade, um, both in terms of just understanding uh, what the expectations are for them when this goes live and that they have the capacity to be able to do it. And so, you know, for for these uh, specific pools or or stackers, it would re require running a Bitcoin node a stacks node and then running a version of the stacks signer binary and these systems have to be running essentially 24 7 um, to ensure that the liveness of the system and, and they can continue um, basically processing those SBDC transactions and getting those rewards so again really just wanted to highlight that um, the way that you know for the ecosystem part of the priority is to make sure that um, any of the the parties that are focused on stacking, running stacking services, interacting with stacking are um, generally prepared for this and, and understand sort of how their business models might change uh, after this upgrade goes live. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And, you know, one of the things that I've been uh, kind of noticing, especially now that like the, you know, the developer release, the testnet is at, out there and you're kind of seeing things like kind of how it's going to look from a web presence and, you know, how it would look within your wallets. So I think a lot of people are getting more of a handle on how exactly this is going to look and feel. Um, and I'm kind of excited that there seems to already be a lot of ecosystem players that are, you know, doing that work now to like kind of plan for SBTC um, yeah. with kind of an expectation to make it uh, kind of a first class citizen within their applications, uh, which I, I personally love. Um, and I guess for those that, are here, maybe you're participating in the developer release, maybe you're just interested in stacks and everything that's going on, so you want to learn more. Um, you know, is there a particular like area of focus or message that we should give the people that are building those next apps in terms of how they should best help 
build that ecosystem or develop it in a way that kind of uh, helps SBTC really shine and be successful within their apps. Um, obviously, it's up to you know the individual developers to build what they think is best. But if there's a way um, that we can you know maybe position SBTC to be more successful with kind of like some design standards, are there any kind of uh, suggestions you have for end users or um, yeah, things, places they should kind of research or anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess first I wanted to start out by, I guess, answering your original question, which is like giving a broader update on um, sort of the, the Stacks ecosystem. I guess this is uh, particularly relating to the developer release. And so there are a couple of uh, ongoing initiatives that are really focused on ensuring that developers were prepared for this release or starting to think about ways that they can integrate SBDC into their applications and, and what that user experience might look like. So, um, you know, there's uh, the testing program that uh, Jenny, I believe is on the call, is, has been leading. There's about, um, you know, 200 users there that have been um, basically starting to test the uh, te the testnet and, and devnet releases that we've had for the SBDC bridge uh, interface and the API. And there's also these the, the Stacks ecosystem, which is the, the chart that you have here. And we've really been focused on providing uh, really hands-on service to many of these applications to start to integrate SBDC in their applications. Um, and the uh, I've been really happy with the response so far. So, um, you know, the, the types of use cases that they span, um, right now it's, uh, I would say it's primarily focused on DeFi there's uh, a couple of lending applications, there's um, trading applications, both in terms of like options and derivatives. Um, there's a, a stable swap protocol that uh, is really helpful for building liquidity uh, that I think will be useful when SBDC is live. Um, there's, you know, atomic swaps between uh, SBDC and the Lightning Network. And so really for this release, the goal was to start having them uh, start to integrate SBDC in their in their applications, understand what the experience would look like. And the first step is, you know, because SBDC is a SIP10 token, they can start to just, um, you know, integrate it into sort of like their normal uh, operations. It's kind of like the, the low hanging fruit. And and then the, the next step there is really around, um, you know, integrating the deposit and withdrawal uh, bridge functionality directly into their apps. And I think that's part of what developers can do to really start to provide a user experience that feels much more Bitcoin native to the end user where, um, you know, the, the application can just uh, essentially allow for a Bitcoin uh, deposit that will essentially interact directly with um, the SBDC protocol and it could trigger some smart contracts on the stacks side. Uh, and that whole process can kind of feel uh, essentially very seamless to the end user. And so, I think we're in the stage now where there's a lot of um, experimentation. There's uh, experimentation in terms of how do you really define that developer experience, really identifying who is the target audience for uh, the application and uh, who might be receptive to different ways of uh, approaching that sort of user experience. And then really just, um, you know, take like being able to provide uh, any feedback from this early uh, stage, this early release, providing that back to the sort of SBDC working group, all the core engineers that are working on this, so that we can continue to uh, refine some of these things. We can, um, you know, make new uh, feature and, and product requirements that are directly based off of this. And, you know, this has already started happening, which has been great. So, um, you know, one of the applications um, in the ecosystem was able to identify that having a different transaction format uh, for Bitcoin. So essentially um, for the SBDC protocol, uh, which currently uses an off return transaction, essentially um, instead using an op drop transaction format could have a, a significant increase in the amount, overall amount of um, functionality that we're able to offer with that. Um, and so specifically it would allow us to allow deposits from uh, custodial addresses that generally more widely support the uh, op drop uh, transaction type, uh, as well as abstracting away some of those steps uh, a little bit easier from the end user. Um, and so, you know, that's the type of feedback that is super helpful for 
us and, and for the working group to continue to hear, to just kind of make that, um, you know, continue to learn from this release and, and get the feedback from developers. Oh, I see. I see you have it up here. <laughs> yeah, great. yeah. I just put that up. I I actually didn't really think about this until Tycho sent out this tweet yesterday, and it's uh, the the emoji he put here. Kind of is is how I felt about it. Um, you know, I was always thinking of it as like, oh, okay, you do your peg in, you get SBTC, then you have, then you make, you know, your decision of how you want to use it. But this kind of seamless ability to just be like, oh, no, I'm sending this Bitcoin from my L1 directly into a smart contract um, to be used in some particular way, I think is, is fantastic. You know, I could especially see it, you know, uh, you know, as we get those faster transaction times with Nakamoto and there's more, you know, there's more volume of trading. There's maybe people wanting to, you know, kind of in a pinch, try to top up a vault that they're using for taking out a loan and being able to just directly deposit that Bitcoin into the vault. That, you know, just removal of those steps to me is a huge UX win. So I thought that was really cool when he kind of broke this down. Um, and, you know, and he's, he's even thrown out here a couple of a couple of uh, ecosystem uh, folks that are that are starting to build with yep. that. So I was very yep. excited about that. Yeah, com completely agree with everything you just said. And and one other thing that I would add is, you know, because Tyco's customers are more institutional focused, they're the ones that are that are primarily custodying in more uh, custodial services. So that was a, a big unlock for his business model. And it's something that helps to just raise visibility for the types of users that might be interacting with the protocol. So yeah, but really great to, to kind of have that sort of interaction with him and, and helps to define those requirements. Yep. Yep. No, a hundred percent. And um, for those on the call, um, if you could drop like a quick emoji, like, or a thumbs up, or maybe a little chat, how many of you are participating in the developer uh, release of SBTC or the test net? Yeah, great. It looks like some some people act getting active with it, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, you guys were able to start getting your hands dirty with the the first set of tasks. Um, I did want to um, briefly just mention that uh, there there it is known that there were some people that were maybe running into a little bit of trouble with the UX for just some of the standard test cases that weren't using the dev environments. Um, but that work has, um, from what I'm from what I'm hearing, largely been fixed. Um, but just wanted to let you know that that is, uh, something that if you did have problems in the past, the last few days, give it another try today. And, uh, those things should, uh, should be back up and working for you guys. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear from some people that maybe, um, have participated and started getting their hands dirty with it. Just kind of as it met, met kind of the expectations of what you thought it was going to work like is, uh, are you getting kind of the feel for how the system's going to work? I'll jump in. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the team for making everything so backwards compatible. I mean, I was able to take stuff I was working on over the summer and just deploy it out to the, the SBTC release and things work fine. And I'm starting to dig into um, you know, what Andrew was just talking about with integrating in deposits and, and things like that. So um, I've been having a, a great time with it. I will say the one piece of feedback is, I don't know what's going on with Stack Explorer and the API, but you know, I'll have the chains up almost immediately, but the API takes probably 10 minutes on my computer to fully boot up afterwards. Other than that, I'm having a great time. Gotcha. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Great feedback. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that opportunity. It's a little bit off topic, but I'll go ahead and, and chill it anyways. Um, when, when you run into some of those API issues, that's a, a great reason to uh, consider running your own nodes. Um, you know, running your own node in your own API server kind of al allows you to kind of get away from some of those uh, limitations that you can run into. Um, and, you know, not sure if people want to necessarily do it for a test net. Um, you know, totally understand that. But definitely when it comes to, um, you know, kind of the main net, I encourage everybody um, to run their own node, run their own API server if you can, if you have the ability. Um, keeping the network decentralized and maybe also making, uh, making your API interactions a lot more smooth. So uh, just wanted to kind of throw that little uh, side note in there. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm very excited to kind of see the, the, 
the ways that developers start to play around with this. It sounds like people are really kind of chomping at the bit. And I'm personally excited about it too, because you know I've always been a little bit hesitant just because of the centralized custodians for wrapped Bitcoin options in the past. It's kind of limited the amount of Bitcoin usage I've done directly on stacks and having this new trust model. I mean, I'm, I'm way excited for being able to really dive into it and use it. And I think a lot of users are in that same boat. Um, so kind of really kind of starting to unlock that Bitcoin economy within stacks. I think this is kind of that key. Um, and I'm excited to, you know, be able to start buying NFTs with sats and, you know, taking out, uh, you know, loans and things like that against my sats. It's, I'm just excited to play with all of it. So, um, you yeah, know, really, really cool to the, see it. The, the one, the one other thing I'll, 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 echo in here with um because i see jenny's on too uh the the developer test net program thing that we're all doing right now um great job uh big big kudos keep things like that up um having us all in discord i've met so many new people i didn't know before we've been problem solving um it's great networking it's, it's great for all these dispersed engineers across the globe um, to be working towards a common goal and solving problems for each other and troubleshooting. And it's, it's, it's been a good experience. Oh, thanks for saying that. Yeah, it's been really great to see you guys collaborating in the channel together. Um, everyone's been so excited to participate. And I will that say... I, I definitely second that. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, and I, I feel like there was maybe some nervousness on like the core dev side releasing a public testnet at this stage. But... Um, but, you know, we had to remind ourselves that like, no, this is a journey that we want to take the community along um, with us on. And it, it, this is just the first phase of what's available. So through all the work you guys are doing and through all the feedback you're giving us, it, it just makes it ensures that we're going to put out the best SBTC experience possible. So it's it's been great to see how willing people have been to hack on this and to encounter problems and work through problems. So thank you guys for being so um, collaborative and cooperative on this. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, the, a lot of the meat and potatoes of what we wanted to kind of cover today. I you know, wanted to make sure people kind of had a sense of what's coming down the pipe with this. Um, you know, some of the innovations that's already being worked on. Um, you know, that, that reference to uh, Tycho's tweet about OpDrop, I mean, you know, I personally was just discovering that <laughs> just yesterday. So, you know, we're all kind of in this learning about the potential um, use cases that are going to be unlocked as this goes live. Um, and I'm just loving kind of seeing the excitement. Um, I guess, Andre, before we kind of wrap up, I guess, would there be, what would you say is what you're most looking forward to with uh, SBTC once it goes live? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think just providing that uh, access to the Bitcoin market is the single most important thing um, because it really is uh, unlocking this very large market that, um, you know, we're excited to make that more productive. You mentioned, you know, buying NFTs and, and taking out loans with it. And, um, you know, those sorts of use cases really where we're sort of like laser focused um, to try to, to provide a good experience. And, um, you know, so, so it all starts with just, providing that sort of big uh, Bitcoin native experience. And um, from there, just figuring out, you know, how to, how to continue to refine the user experience, the de developer experience to make it a place where um, developers feel uh, really kind of like meets their needs and, and they get excited about building on. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I definitely, um, yeah, appreciate you joining, joining us today to kind of give us your perspectives there. And then also just more broadly, Thanks for all the work you've done in terms of bringing this into fruition. I know you've been a big uh, instrumental part of SBTC and the community thanks you for that. Um, and that also extends to Jude, the rest of the core devs. Uh, we don't thank you guys enough um, for all the work you do building this awesome tech stack for us to be able to use and play around with and kind of realize our hopes and dreams about how Bitcoin's gonna work in the economy. So definitely want to uh, just give you guys uh, explicit thanks for that. Um, and I'll, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll just say I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, it really is a 
community-wide effort. You know, there's lots of folks um, that are working on this and I kind of get to be uh, like the spokesperson often and um, that's great, uh, but there's uh, a lot of different contributors and um, working groups kind of all focused on bringing this together. So, you know, it's it's great to be a part of the the community that's working on this. Yeah, no, love it, love it. Um, and then one last thing here, I did create kind of like a quiz um, for the community to jump into. Um, after we get through um, the Nakamoto release as well, we're going to hopefully reward uh, some lucky lucky participants with uh, some NFTs. So I wanted to just kind of extend this out to folks to take this survey, test your knowledge of SBTC, see if you kind of have some of the understanding of the mechanics that works, uh, of how it works. Um, and then if you are interested in that, you can always drop your Discord handle into that to uh, potentially win some NFTs down the road. Um, kind of just giving you a little bit of a heads up of what's coming in the upcoming weeks. So we just did, uh, this session was the last in our SBTC focused education series. Um, but next we'll be going into the Nakamoto upgrade and some of the new capabilities um, and details um, associated with that. So next week, November 3rd, we'll do kind of a general overview um, we'll get into uh, the consensus mechanism and incentives on November 10th. And then for November 17th, um, just kind of going with more of a developer-focused um, session targeting what they would need to necessarily keep in mind with the changes that are coming. So definitely earmark those. Uh, if you're interested in the Nakamoto upgrade and all of the new features and capabilities that come along with it, uh, please make sure to uh, add those to your calendars uh, and join those sessions. Um, and we'll hopefully get these, uh, the details worked out. I know a lot of folks have been asking about recordings for the sessions. Uh, we're working on that. So we'll hopefully, especially with the next, uh, next few, um, have a better solution in place to be able to get those out in a timely manner to you guys. Um, but with that, uh, that's really kind of the, the items I had on the agenda for today. So I'll pause and see if anybody has particular questions, comments, um, feedback on these educational sessions, other things that you would like to learn about, um, please let us know. Um, you know. Constantly looking to improve this and make it more useful for you guys. It's all for education of the community. So if there's gaps or blind spots, uh, just let us know. Yeah, I just want to say um, a crossfire uh, aside from the simple, like um, I think I feel like the community feedback on the, like you jumping into like a, a casual Twitter space has been pretty valuable. Uh, so I just want to put that on the radar. Say, yeah, like uh, I think like a more, I think people feel like a little bit intimidated asking questions on this call. But mm -hmm. uh, I think like a more casual to the space, people feel like they can ask you any question and they don't feel like they're stupid kind of thing can be pretty valuable. Uh, so yeah, I just want to put that uh, out there. Yeah, no, totally. That's, um, that's good feedback. And I even get that myself. It's much easier um, when it's kind of a, I guess more of an ad hoc session, right? Where, you know, people are just having various conversation topics. It's a little bit more approachable for, you know, for really getting those questions answered. So totally, uh, to totally get that. Um, and we did have the, like kind of a good session. I know with like the, the Stacks Australia guys uh, where we were able to do a little bit of a Q and A. Um, and maybe, you know, if it would help, that's something that maybe we can follow up with maybe for next week, just have like a, you know, just a random Twitter space. I'll look at just finding a time where, you know, people can just kind of hop in and maybe ask some questions if they have, and maybe nobody joins, maybe some people do, um, if people have questions and, and happy to facilitate that. So, you know, good, good feedback. It's, it's, it's happening kind of organically too, right? Because the, the people that are in the, the dev program are joining spaces and are able to answer questions a little bit better there. Um, so, like, just in general, I, I love spaces, and, and there's more and more talk about SBTC and folks that used to, like, snub their nose a little bit at stacks as, you know, this isn't Bitcoin, this, get, get out of here, um, are starting to 
found a lot more accepting and, and even curious in a lot of places. So I, I think the, the movement is happening kind of organically under the covers and, and it's, uh, it's definitely happening. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. No, I love that. And because I don't mind asking dumb questions on these kind of calls, uh, I put it in chat kind of facetiously, but it, it, in in working in UI designs and things like that, BTC converts into SBTC. Is there like any kind of common nomenclature being tossed around for what SATs would be considered on stacks? Because like SATs doesn't really work. <laughs> Yeah, the the double S there. Yeah, no, that's a good. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, you know, that's that's one that. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. Even though it's S S B T C, I mean, I I personally just kind of still just think of it as B T C, just with a different set of trade offs, right? Um, you know, and so like on on chain, and when I'm interacting with it, I'm still really just going to be calling it B T C. Um, right. You know, even I, though I the U S has the S in there. <laughs> this is more yeah. for for applications that are targeting things like for a dollar or 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 two dollars, which converts into dot zero 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 zero, and and like all of a sudden, if you're dealing with it at the BTC level, it's hard to display in a UI. But when you like convert everything over to Sats, when you're dealing on the the layer one, it kind of looks and feels a little bit better. So I was just wondering what the Sats counterpart would be um, on on stack a, a name will organically kind of get adopted I was just wondering if there was one floating around now yeah my uh, my personal take on it would be like I would think that a cool way to, to kind of lay that out would be to just delineate it as BTC and sats in the UX and maybe just give a designation of like facilitated through SBTC or something like that, because you want them to know, you know, what, what form of Bitcoin they're using, like what trade-offs they're, you know, working with. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it is, it is Bitcoin value that they're moving around and shifting around. And, you know, people could just think of them as, you know, these are sats, these are, these are Bitcoin that I'm sending back and forth uh, on the network, just like I do on the Bitcoin L1. That would be my personal take on it, but that that may not work in every scenario. Um, uh, Andre, have you seen uh, kind of conversations about this kind of uh, topic before? I haven't. It's actually, I think, the first time that I'm I'm hearing this question. But um, yeah, I can give it some thought. I think the way that you described it, Crossfire, makes sense to me. Um, but uh, but yeah, no no strong opinions right now. We'll get figured yeah. out along the way. Yeah, no, but that might be a good one to have in that um, ad hoc Twitter Twitter space, right? Because um, I feel like that's a you know kind of a good format for those kinds of UX discussions. We can get some feedback from just end users, NFT marketplaces. It's kind of a broader set of folks. Um, you might get some get some good answers there. Yeah, and I think it's largely driven by ordinals and like the whole layer one rare sat marketplace that's being developed. You just like every, every when when you deal with the ordinal crowd, like you're talking to folks that talk in SAS, right? They don't talk in BTCs, they talk in SAS. And then how does that convert over to layer two when you're, when you're thinking that way? Yep. Yep. Well, cool guys. Um, yeah, again, I definitely suggest everybody, um, you know, plan to jump in for those Nakamoto upgrades. There's going to be a lot of synergies between what's happening with SBTC and what's happening with the Nakamoto upgrade. So even though they're two separate topics, there will be some overlap in some areas. Um, and they're both going to be, you know, very, very crucial changes for the Stacks ecosystem. So I encourage everybody to do that. If you are interested in uh, just the standard SIP process and changes that are going on in the ecosystem, um, I am going to be scheduling a SIP editor space for this coming Thursday. Um, that will happen at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so if you don't follow me already on Twitter, give me a follow. You'll get updates about um, those Twitter spaces as they come. 
and we'll be discussing some of these SIP activity, um, what stages there are, and there's recently some ones that have moved from accepted into the Tech Cab review recently. And then there's also some new ideas that are just coming down the pipe that will uh, hopefully get presented in those meetings. Uh, so that can be a great way to keep on tab uh, on top of the various SIPs. And then once this educational series is completed, we'll be kind of going back to our standard SIP call process on Fridays where we can go through um, you know, various ideas, new innovations that people are looking to bring to the Stacks ecosystem. Uh, so keep an eye out for those. Um, but thank you everybody for your time today. We'll uh, uh, be back here same time, same place next week and uh, we'll be giving some more education to the community. So thank you everybody for participating. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys. See you yeah. next week. Thank you.